There's, a, there's this one little line in chapter 5 that gives us a little bit of insight on what's going on in chapter 3. And you'll see kind of how it fits together. So I want to read this just so that we know what's going on in this time. You may say, well, wait, are we still in the time of Othniel? Nope. Remember, he just has died. They had 40 years of peace. But after, it tells us, after each of the judges dies, things kind of go haywire. Things kind of fall apart. And so this one little comment tells us about the time that is uh, that we're about to look at. It says, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, don't know who Jael is, but we know who Shamgar is. We'll see in a second. In the days of Shamgar, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. Now, that may seem like a really kind of out there comment, like why would the highways be deserted? Well, let's remember that they didn't have vehicles that could go at 70, 80, or, you know, if it's some of you, 90 miles an hour. Uh, What they had to do is they had to go at about walking speed. And it's really easy to rob people that go at walking speed. If you try, I don't know if you ever tried to rob somebody, I hope you haven't, but just to let you know, if you tried to rob a car that's moving at 70 miles an hour, you're going to get killed. If you lived in the ancient world, though, you would know that traveling on a road is the most likely place you're going to get robbed. It's the most likely place you're going to get kidnapped. It's the most likely place you're going to get hurt or maimed or whatever. And so what this is telling us is that this time where Shamgar was alive is a really rotten time. It was a time that you couldn't even take the roads because it was so dangerous. People were so evil. And so notice what it says. It says, and the travelers walked along the byways, which basically means they're kind of walking through paths in the woods. Like, oh, I'm not taking the big road because that's where I'm going to lose all my money. I'll I'll go through the woods. I don't care. I don't don't want to have anything to do with getting robbed. And so that's the kind of situation that this next era is uh, is. Um, exemplified by. So now let's go back to chapter 3, and this is what it says about Shamgar. It says, Shamgar, son of Anath, struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. And by the way, that's all we have of Shamgar. We don't have any other mention of Shamgar. But this dude was interesting. So let's just kind of break this apart. So Shamgar, we don't know who Anath is. That's another name we're not sure about. But Shamgar was the son of Anath. uh, And it tells us what he did. What he was known for is striking down 600 Philistines with an ox code. Now, the Philistines were the enemies of the children of Israel. The Philistines, they were some of the people that Israel, if they had been obeying God, would have driven out of the land. And they would not have married them. And the Philistines are going to continue to be a problem even on into the days of David. And so the Philistines, are a known entity that are causing all kinds of problems for the Israelites. And what we see here is that Shamgar goes to war with a cattle prod. I mean, that's what an ox goad is. I don't know if you've ever heard of an ox goad, but it, it, it wasn't elect- like today we have cattle prods that you hit a button and it's like, you know, it has electricity. In those days, it was basically a stick with a sharp end. And you'd kind of give the, if it was an ox, you'd kind of give them a little, little poke. Well, Shamgar takes it upon himself to go to war, and it doesn't say anybody's with him. It just says he does this, and so maybe he was leading an army, but it seems like it's him doing it. So Shamgar goes to war basically with a sharp stick. That's what it's telling us. Now, I want to kind of compare this to something that I've noticed even in my own life, is that uh, sometimes it's easy for us to kind of get on this idea that that, uh, if I try to take action without having the right tools, I'll suffer. And the idea here is that that we kind of tend to want to wait around for God to act. I guess we could put it that way. You know, we know that there's certain things that we ought to do that are going to be difficult. And a lot of times our excuse is, well, I'm not really prepared for that. You know, I'm not really prepared to do what God has asked me to do. And some examples of tools in our own life might be stuff like, Education. You might say, well, you know, I, I know I probably should share the gospel with my friends, but I haven't really been educated. I don't have, I didn't go to seminary or anything like that. I didn't, you know, I haven't been to Bible college. I, you know, I, all I did was Sunday school and, you know, I'm not really prepared. But remember, I, uh, uh, Shamgar went to war with a stick. And so I just am thinking, you know, maybe, maybe the tools don't matter as much as the obedience. Another, another thing that we could say is, I don't have much influence. You know, I know God wants me to, to do something, I maybe share my faith with my coworkers or something like that, but I don't have any influence with it. Everybody thinks I'm goofball or something. And so, you know, I don't have that tool. It'd be easiest for us to just kind of back off and say, I'm not going to do it. But remember, Shamgar went to war with a sharp stick. Here's another. I don't have time. I'm just too busy. 
I just don't have time to, to do what God wants me to do. I, you know, I'm, I'm providing for my family, you know. I, but remember, Shamgar went to war with a, with a stick. Uh, and here's a big one, and I, I feel this one sometimes. I don't have the money. I mean, that's a tool, right? I don't have the money to maybe give to missions or to, you know, uh, support, you know, uh, missionary efforts. But remember, Shamgar went to war with a sharp stick. And what did he do? He won, over and over, apparently, because I can't imagine that you'd kill 600 Philistines in one sitting with a sharp stick. I'm thinking that probably had to take some time. So not did he, I'm guessing, he didn't go to war once. He continued to do it, and he continued to win. And he didn't go off and say, I need to find different tools. I need a sword or a helmet or something. He said, hey, the stick will do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey God, and I'm going to go out and do what I'm supposed to do. And some of us might say, I don't have the personality for it. I don't have the, the personality that, that shares my faith. Or I, I'm kind of picking on that one. But, but, you know, we know that we ought to be sharing our faith. And a lot of times we, we have this, these excuses that we don't have the right tools. And sometimes it's, it's so personal. It's like, I just don't think I can do it. It just doesn't fit me. But remember, Shamgar, you know, he did the thing with the stick. So Shamgar, son of Anath, struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat. He, too, saved Israel. Now, notice, we talked about Othniel. Okay, Othniel, very important character, uh, you know, one of the, the great known judges. But notice, this puts Shamgar on the same level. It says he too, he also, he as well saved Israel. He saved Israel from her enemies with a sharp stick. It just makes me think, what could we do? What, what could we do with what we've been given? And you know what? I don't even know the answer to that. I mean, I would have never thought that a one person with an ox goad could do such a thing. So if I try to take action without having the right tools, I'll suffer. But Shamgar saved Israel by going to war with a cattle prod. Imagine what you could do with what you have. Verse 12, and the children of Israel again did evil. I mean, even after Shamgar, after Othniel, you'd think they'd begin to get the point. But notice what it says. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Notice again, it's not a coincidence. It says that God strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. It's not a random occurrence. God is doing this. Okay, we're going back into the same cycle. The people are falling away from God. And this next story, I'm just going to warn you, is a little graphic and a little bit... uh, Frightening. So let's see what happens. Verse 13. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek. When, uh, <clears throat> oh, this, well, I should have practiced these words more. I did practice them, but boy. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. Now, you may not know what the city of Palms is, but in reality, you actually do, probably, if you've ever heard uh, Old Testament stories. It's a, it goes by another name, and we'll see what that is. It's Jericho. Now, notice what has to happen here. I mean, Jericho was the site of one of the greatest Old Testament miracles. Do you remember what it was? Remember the walls? They walked around, they played some big band tunes, and then the walls just fell down. And that's one of the great moments in the history of Israel but now they're having to fight for it again. I mean, this is something has gone wrong, right? I mean, this is a battle they already won, and they've got to fight for it again. And I think there's a lesson in this for us. I don't want to stretch it too much, but I know that I, I tend to have to fight the same kind of battles, and if I don't stay on guard certain parts of my life, certain sins that I feel like I've defeated, man, they are ready to come back. And so we've got to stay vigilant, and I think the same was true for Israel. They refused to stay vigilant. They kept falling into this cycle. They kept kind of letting it happen. And because of that, they had to fight battles. And guess what? I bet taking the city of Palms was harder the second time than it was the first. This time it was with swords and with blood. And so they brought this upon themselves. Verse 14, so the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Notice the the time period's getting a little longer. Last, it was eight years they were under uh, kind of uh, paying tribute and they were slaves. Now, it's 18 years. So the time, the suffering is expanding. 
Verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, you see that again? They, 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 they suffer and then they cry out to the Lord. It gets God's plan to bring them back. He uses suffering to get them back. And the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Okay, so there's a lot going on in there. First of all, it tells us that he's left-handed. That was a little bit, un- actually, that was a lot uncommon in the ancient world. You used your left hand for certain uncouth things. And so for a left-handed person to be left-handed, um, they probably are stubborn. Because it, what, what you'll, you may have heard stories like this. There are certain countries even today that try to discourage left-handedness. And so who knows? I'm making a guess here, but I'm going to take a guess. This guy probably was stubborn. He's like, I'm going to be left-handed. That's what feels natural to me. And it's actually important to the story, too. We'll see that in a second. So the children of Israel cry out to the Lord, and the Lord raises up a deliverer, another judge. His name is Ehud, and he's the son of Gera. don't know anything about Gera, but he's a Benjamite. So that means he, uh, he descends from Benjamin, a very important tribe, and it tells us he's left-handed, and it's by him that the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now you may, what's this tribute thing about? Well, in the ancient world, the way that it worked, the way it would work, if you are a conquering nation, what you would require of the nations that you've conquered is tribute. It's basically tax. I mean, the, that country is... Uh, is um, required to bring you a certain amount of whatever it is, gold, goats, I don't know. It's, it's, who knows what it was at the time? But, but some tribute, something of monetary value, they are required to give you as the conquering nation. And so when it says that they are under the thumb of Moab, what that means is a lot of their money and their resources, probably even people, which would go into slavery under Moab, they would be required to be sent to Moab. And so what happens here is Ehud, who is this next leader, he's this next, and, and as far as we know at this point, he's, he's untested, but it tells us that God is raising up this guy. He is part of the delegation that's to take the tribute to this king in Moab, their, um, their overlord, so to speak. In verse 16, now Ehud made for himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length. Now we think that a cubit is about this long, and so it'd be different, a little bit different for each person. But it's it's not a huge dagger, but it's it's big enough to get the job done. Um, and uh, you'll see what the job is. It's a dirty business here in a second. And fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. Now that's important because if you are going into the palace of a king, they're going to check you for weapons. But just about everybody you've ever met in the ancient world is right-handed. So where would you strap your, your weapon? Usually you'd strap it on the side where you could grab it. And so it'd be either on this side, because it's a little awkward to do this, and it'd be awkward to do, you know, to do on this side. So usually, if you're going to hide it, you'd strap it on the opposite side of your hand. Since hardly anybody's left-handed, I guess what we're seeing here is maybe they didn't check the right side of his body. And so he strapped it on that side, kind of in an unexpected place. And that allowed him to carry that double-edged dagger in with him when he went to do tribute. Verse 17, so he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. Also an important detail. It's not just making fun of him. It's telling us of an important detail. Some of you guys may remember this story from Sunday school. I remember the day that my Sunday school teacher read this story, and I think you'll, you'll see why. I, I found it so bizarre. Verse 18, and when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. Okay, now this is important to me because this says that Ehud is not trying to get anybody else hurt. He's about to have to do something that is dangerous and it's a dirty business. And he takes the rest of his people, which would have been natural to say, hey, we're going to do this together. It's going to be teamwork. But Ehud says, no, no, I don't want anybody else to get hurt. I want you guys to go on. So they carried the tribute in, but then he sends them on and he goes about the business that he came for. Verse 19, but he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. Now, there's a detail in here that I wonder about, and I can't say for sure, but it mentions twice in here stone images in this story. Here's what I think is going on. I think, and this is my speculation, I'm just going to let you know I'm speculating here, but I think what would happen is when the, uh, when the children of Israel came to bring tribute, 
they had to come to this place where there were the gods of the Moabs, the Moabites, and they were these stone images because this this, uh, tribute is apparently given at this location. That's where they are. And so they bring the tribute to this place where there are these stone images. Now, for the children of Israel, they're not supposed to be involved with foreign gods, right? They're not supposed to worship idols. They're not supposed to do any of this. My guess is that the king of Moab forces them to take part in this ritual. Totally my guess, but I don't know why else it would mention these stone images multiple times in this story. So I think what we're seeing here is the king of Moab forcing the children of Israel not only to pay tribute, but to pay homage to these foreign gods. I think this maybe is what frustrates Ehud so much. So notice what he does. Ehud, he lets everybody else go, and then he tells the king, I've got a a special message for you. It's kind of like a private message. You can't just say it out in front of everyone else. So notice what happens here. This is the king. He said, keep silent, and all who attended him went out from him. So he, he then now, Ehud is now with just the king because he said he has this special message. Verse 20, so Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in, the, in his cool private chamber. I think that's the bathroom. I think that's what that means. It's, it's not real clear. Different translators do it different ways. It seems like that might be the bathroom or something because of what we see in a moment. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he rose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Now, this is like one of those amazing um, phrases that you see in action movies. I have a message from God to you, and then he stabs him. I don't want to make light of it, but it's it's like this... It's like this irony, like here's what God, uh, this is the message I'm delivering to you from God. It's this amazing kind of final line that he says to the king. I have a message from God to you. Then he pulls out his dagger, which he wasn't supposed to have. I mean, certainly he had been searched by this point, but he pulls out his dagger and he stabs the man. The next verse is, is graphic. Even the hilt went in after the blade and the fat closed around the blade. For he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I thought about leaving this line out. I thought about leaving it out, but I thought, no, it's the Bible. We're just going to read it. We're going to let it be what it is. So, I, you know, I, I, it's, just, it's just what it is. It's just telling the story. This is a graphic scene. But remember, this is God's plan, apparently, to relieve the suffering off of his people Israel. So he stabs him. The man is so fat that the dagger gets lost in the fat and some other terrible things happen. Let's move on. Verse 23, Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked him. So probably what this is, is he's got this upper room and it's got probably a balcony or some kind of exit. So Ehud does the dirty business and then he leaves not through the main entrance, not through those doors. And apparently even those doors, uh, the front doors are locked. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to, his, to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. That's kind of a nice way of saying, see, that's why I thought cool, cool chamber might be the bathroom, because it says he's attending to his needs. Let's move on again. So, but here, here's what's going on. So they come to the door, they're knocking on the door and like, oh, this is embarrassing. I think maybe he's you know, um, in the bathroom. And so they don't go in immediately. They're like, you know, we don't want to embarrass him. I don't want to be embarrassed. It'd be, it's bad to walk in on somebody uh, like that. So verse 25, so they waited till they were in, uh, until they were embarrassed. Uh, one translation says to the point of embarrassment, meaning at this point we've waited long enough that it seems like there's something wrong. And it's probably, even if we get embarrassed, uh, we probably need to go in anyway. So they waited till the point of embarrassment and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. There Therefore, they took the key and opened them, and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. What a graphic and awful story, but this is the kind of dirty business that the judges of Israel had to do. It was not an easy job. I mean, it was a difficult job. It was painful. It was dangerous. It was inconvenient. And you can see why it's difficult in this time to obey God, because it is a hard business to rescue Israel from their oppressors. Verse 26, but Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sarah. 
27, And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and, they, and he led them. Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered from your enemies the Moabites into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. Basically what it's telling us is they took their land back. They, they kind of put up a new border, said nobody comes past the, uh, past the Jordan here. So they are now fighting back for the land that had been stolen from them. 29, and at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. Verse 30, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the, and the land had rest for how long this time? 80 years. Interesting. We see that same pattern that we saw before. So, here's a question that you, you may have asked. How long must I suffer? How long do we have to suffer? Now, I should say, not all suffering comes because God's disciplining us. I have a friend who sent me a message a while back, said, I hurt my back, I think God's disciplining me. I said, I, I don't know if that's true. I mean, uh, you know, are you in sin? He's like, no, not, not really, I don't think. I just, you know, it just seems like it probably is God. And I said, that's not always suffering. Suffering is not always because God's disciplining. Now, God does sometimes use suffering to bring about a change, but we have to be careful from saying that all suffering is God disciplining us. But sometimes... It is, and therefore, we do need to ask this kind of question. Is it possible that my suffering is God trying to get my attention in this situation? And when that happens, we often would probably ask, how long does this suffering have to go on? Well, notice this. Once again, we saw that the Israelites were subject for eight years first, and then they were subject for 18 years. And then after eight years of being subject, they got 40 years of peace and then they got 80 years of peace after 18 years of, uh, of being subject. So what we see is that God is generous when He finally brings the relief. It's a short time of suffering, and then there's this long period of enjoyment and relaxation and peace that follows. And I'll tell you, I think that that probably is still true in our lives today. And I know, at least in one way, that it is absolutely true, and we're going to kind of explore that. So how long must we suffer? Well, one answer might be, how long will it take you to cry out to God? I mean, in the case of Israel, that's what God wanted. The suffering could have happened for two days, and if they would have cried out to God at that point, probably the suffering would have stopped. The suffering lasted until they cried out to God. It makes me wonder, in our own lives, if the suffering that we face is because of discipline, it makes us think, is it possible that, you know, that discipline would end if we would cry out to God, we would turn to God or even repent of some of those difficulties that are in our lives? The other thing to remember is that they suffer less time than they experience peace and enjoyment. Now, this is not necessarily a promise. This is just a principle that we see in Judges. But there is a promise that we do know about in the New Testament. And I want to look at it briefly, and then we're going to be done. The suffering, this is Paul, the suffering of this present time, I'm sorry, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's an incredible statement. This is Paul, this is in Romans. He's saying that no matter what suffering you're experiencing, and so this applies to us today, no matter what suffering you're experiencing now, no matter how bad it is, no matter how, how intolerable it seems, it's nothing compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And this is talking to believers, of course, the glory that's going to be revealed in us at Christ's return. He says this, he goes on, the creation uh, eagerly waits for the revealing of the Son of God because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That line there, uh, the bondage of corruption, it seems to fit so well with what we see in Judges and sometimes even what we see in our own lives. So much of the suffering in the world, maybe we could say all of the suffering of the world, goes back to corruption at some point. At some level, there's some sin that causes suffering. It may be direct or it may be indirect. It could be generational. It could be back to the Garden of Eden. But all suffering comes ultimately from sin. And it says that creation is like, like longing to be changed, longing to be released from the suffering that comes from that corruption. 
Notice what he says here, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So we see what what Paul's saying here. He's saying no matter how bad your suffering is, it's not even worthy to be compared to what's going to happen in eternity. And I, I think that can help us kind of walk through our suffering with a little bit more poise, a little bit more grace, a little bit more ability to look forward to what's to come. It's not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. So the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall shall be revealed in us. Remember, eight years of suffering resulted in 40 years of peace and enjoyment for Israel. Eighteen years of suffering resulted in 80 years of peace and enjoyment for Israel. And here's how it applies to us. We suffer 80 years if we're strong, if we, if we live out a full life, 90 years maybe if we're healthy. That's how long we suffer. That seems like a long time. Now, that doesn't mean we suffer every day, but you're going to face suffering. I'm going to face suffering. I mean, it's just, it's just part of life because we live in a broken world. Even in Judges, we see that cycle over and over, and we can kind of feel that cycle in our own lives. But what Paul's reminding us here is that though we suffer 80, 90 years, we're going to experience peace and enjoyment for eternity. That's if we're believers. And so I think most of us in the room probably have believed in Jesus for salvation, but it's something to think about. That if your suffering is great, is it possible, especially if you've never considered whether or not you have eternal life. If you've never considered uh, the, the salvation issue, is it possible that God is even using your suffering to bring you toward that moment where you believe in Him for salvation? And for us believers, for those that have believed for salvation, we have eternal life, no matter what happens, He's made that promise to us. Is it possible that our suffering is so that we could draw closer to Him? We're never going to lose our eternal life once we have it. Once we believe in Him, it is a done deal. But... We can lose our fellowship. We can begin to stray from where He wants us. Is it possible in our lives that that suffering is His plan to move us back toward Him? I think it's a possibility. Suffering does that for us. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. That is a punch in the gut, isn't it? After all of this, Ehud did the the dirty business of taking care of the king of Moab and the children of Israel fall into it again. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And that's where we're going to end the story for today. (laughs) 